Hello everyone. Good evening. It's 8 p.m. UK time, so we can start our webinar. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, um, so today I will be your host. My name is Caroline. So I'd like to welcome you to Egg Donation Friends webinar. And as you probably can see, we are going to discuss IVF failure using donor eggs, so embryo quality, implantation problems, and miscarriage. Of course, it will be presented by Dr. Maria Arke from Ferti International, which is a clinic in Barcelona. The presentation will take approximately from 25 to 30 minutes, and afterwards, uh, we, uh, we will have a Q&A session. So, of course, during that time, you will be able to type in all the questions you have, and of course, right, uh, after, right after that, the doctor will be able to answer them one by one. Okay? And of course, remember that the webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to check the recording later on as well, and I believe we can start. Yes? Are you ready to start, uh, Dr. Maria? Yes, I'm ready. All right, let's begin then. Perfect. So, first of all, uh, good evening to everyone. I would like to start by um, saying thank you to Egg Donation Friends for inviting me to present that webinar about this very interesting topic, which is IPF failure using donor eggs, embryo quality, implantation failure, and miscarriage. I would like to start my presentation with a clinical case. So this is a couple that we had in our clinic. Obviously, their names are changed because of security reasons and data protection. So Mark was 44 years old and Jane was 42 years old, and they came with five years of primary infertility. They have had three unsuccessful IVF cycles uh, with Jane X. In total, they had four embryos transferred, two miscarriages, one embryo of those was unemployed and the other one was euploid. And in the last cycle, they've done PGS and they didn't have any embryos that were suitable for transfer. After that, they have decided to do two cycles of egg donation and in total, they had three blastocysts transferred and they had one miscarriage with an embryo that was euploid as well. So the discussion that I had with that couple in terms of trying to make them understand what are the main reasons why IVF can, can fail when we're using donor eggs are the same that I'm going to explain to you all today. So mainly we can differentiate uh, three main causes when we're having IVF uh, failure with egg donation, which are mainly the embryo itself, the endometrium, or the blood flow and immunology. So when we're speaking about the embryo, we know that even though we might have a good quality blastocyst in terms of the morphology of the embryo, that doesn't necessarily mean that this embryo is euploid. Um, most of the eggs that are going to come from an egg donor are going to be euploid. We know that in general, the rate of euploidy is around 70%, but still there's a 30% rate of likelihood that uh, the eggs coming from a donor are not completely normal. And on the other hand, we also have to rule out the possibility that any kind of alterations in the embryo might also come from the male side. So any alterations of the semen analysis or genetic alterations in the karyotype in a fish test or DNA fragmentation might also lead to a decreased uh, success rate using a uh, cycle with uh, egg donor. This is a very interesting paper that was published recently in which uh, it was seen that the euploidy rates coming from egg donors can significantly differ between fertility centers. In average, in general, we consider that the expected uh, euploidy rate for uh, egg donor would be 70%, but, but there are, there's still this 30% rate of an euploidies that we would be expecting from the egg donor. And there are multiple factors that can um, have an important impact on the, on the likelihood of the euploidy rate that are linked to the stimulation of the egg donation of the egg donor cycle, to the processes done in the lab, and several other factors. So 
One question that might arise your attention or that you might be thinking of is, well, then if there's part of the eggs that come from a donor that might not be euploid and that can lead to embryos with an eupoid, should we be doing PGS to, um, in the case that we're doing a cycle with a donor? So there was that very nice story that was recently published as well, in which they compared cycles that were done with donor eggs in which they've done PGS and some of them and others that they did not do PGS. And uh, that confirmed the data that I already explained that there is an average of 30% of eggs on embryos from egg donors that are going to be unemployed. And that what they saw is that the PGS was not associated with an improved pregnancy outcome compared with non-PGS cycles. So in terms of using PGS, on embryos from donor eggs, the, the benefits might be limited and that should be framed within each individual case. Okay. Let's move to the, to the next uh, main factor that can contribute to, to the fact that the cycle is not um, successful. And this is uh, concerning the endometrium. Okay. So, uh, in the endometrium, we can have anatomic factors that might interfere with the likelihood of having an endometrium that is receptive. We will also speak a little bit about the concept of refractory endometrium and what we can do to try to aim to have a better endometrium. What's the implantation window and the importance of the implantation window in success rates and the endometrial receptivity. So when we, we speak about uterine anatomic factors, we must take in consideration that the presence of fibroids inside the uterine cavity might interfere with implantation. The presence of polyps or additions as well, and also uh, the uterine malformations. So those are all factors that should be addressed before we do an embryo transfer. When we speak about what we call the refractory endometrium, we are referring to uh, that endometrium in which even though we have tried several different kinds of protocol in terms of trying to have an endometrium that it's um, what we would be expecting to have a good result, that in general, the agreement between uh, the European Society of Human Reproduction and the ASRM and most of the fertility clinics could be that we would be aiming to have a seven millimeter endometrium with triple uh, pattern. So the Refractory endometrium would be that endometrium in which, even though we try to, to give different protocols of medication, we don't achieve that minimum thickness or that pattern. Okay, what would be the main causes for having that thin endometrium that it's not responding to the medication? So, one of the causes might be surgical etiology. Okay, patients who have had previously surgeries uh, inside the uterus, like dilation and coretage, because they had miscarriages before or patients who have had a hysteroscopy with myomectomy or septoplasty, they have higher risk of then having endometriums that are not responding as well as expected. And uh, the formation of additions is also higher in patients who have had surgeries before, and there is a high risk of recurrence depending on, on the kind of surgery that they had. The past medical history of radiotherapy in the pelvic area can also lead to having a, a uterus with a smaller volume, with less blood flow, and that might lead also to have pregnancies with a higher risk of low birth weight, uh, miscarriage, preterm deliveries, and also obviously to have less chances of a successful outcome with a fertility treatment because of not achieving an endometrium that is receptive. Patients with uterine malformations will also have endometriums that are not going to reach probably the seven millimeter uh, target. And the past medical history of endometritis or current endometritis can also be considered as something that might impact those results. Uterine malformations are not very prevalent. They affect around 0.5% of the female population and uh, the prevalence of the symptoms is higher in infertile patients. And those patients might also be carriers of sex chromosome mosaicism. So that's something that has to be taken in consideration as well. The majority of uh, patients who have endometritis 
are patients who um, are asymptomatic, but sometimes they can have symptoms that can be from mild to severe. And those symptoms vary from pelvic pain, bleeding, leukorrhea, dyspareunia, having micropolyps in the hysteroscopy, and other symptoms and characteristics in the findings of the hysteroscopy. In most of the cases, the causes are common bacteria, and uh, in some cases and in some areas in which the prevalence is high, it can also be linked to tuberculosis. Um, the diagnosis is difficult to do because sometimes even though we do an endometrial culture, that might not be diagnostic because there are some kind of anaerobism viruses that might not be detected. And on the other hand, because the endometrial cavity is not sterile cavity, so we might still find some bacteria. So the most important thing to look at when we're uh, taking a, a biopsy sample to look for endometrial desire of plasma cells. And in that sense, uh, once we have a result, what we would be doing normally is to, to treat with antibiotic, even though there are contradictory results. Some studies report better results and some others don't. But whenever we have an antibiogram available, we would be treating accordingly for 10 or 14 days. There is a, a very nice uh, published study regarding what would be the strategies that we would be using for patients who have refractory endometrium and how can we address that and try to, to have better, uh, a better lining. So from all those strategies, as you see here, um, the only one that has proved to, have a to be a beneficial intervention has been hysteroscopy. The rest of them, for most of them, we have an unclear effect, so they are still under study, but we might use them sometimes. And uh, there are some other strategies like giving very high doses of stradio or very long courses of stradio that have, have proven that they don't have any, any benefit. Let's talk about the importance of the window of endometrial receptivity. The window of endometrial receptivity naturally happens six days after the LH surge, and it usually lasts for around four days. This is very important to take that into consideration whenever we're going to transfer the embryos. So what we will be doing is starting to give the progesterone to the patient in the moment in which we know that we're going to then transfer the embryos. There is a lot of data already published telling us when would be the best moment to start the progesterone. And we know that when we're about to transfer embryos on day three, we should be starting the progesterone four days before. When we're transferring the embryos on day four, we should be starting the progesterone five days before. And when we're transferring blastocyst, we should be starting the progesterone six days before, okay? This is a very nice um, proposal of clinical practice about how to time the embryo transfer in different preparation methods, depending on if we're using a completely um, formal replaced therapy treatment for the, for the cycle, or we're doing a modified natural cycle or a completely natural cycle. The endometrial receptivity test is a test that I wanted to mention because it is important in patients who have had several embryo transfers with good quality embryos that did not implant, we might um, have to study if there is a displacement of this window of implantation. And this is exactly what the endometrial receptivity test is going to check for. That window of implantation that I was explaining that usually lasts for four days and naturally of course six days after the LH surge might be displaced in some patients and therefore we can do that test that it's a test that it's done uh, with a biopsy that it's going to study for more than 250 genes that are linked with the receptivity of the endometrium. Most of the patients will have uh, a result of a receptive endometrium around 90% of the patients but uh, in some patients, we might see that their endometrium is pre-receptive or post-receptive. In that sense, if that's the case, what we're going to do is to start the progesterone accordingly to the result of that test, which means that we're going to do a personalized 
embryo transfer as a treatment and that might lead to having a successful outcome. Now I would like to move on to the blood flow and immunology and the effect of those in the likelihood of having a, a, a successful outcome or a failure with activation. So thrombophilia, it's something that should be also studied in patients who have had recurrent losses or implantation failures. In, if we follow the um, ESHRI guidelines that have been issued last year, the ones that we would start in to, to test for before are the acquired thrombophilia, that are the ones that uh, are linked to the antiphospholipid uh, antibodies and the antiphospholipid syndrome, and also the anti V2 glycoprotein as well. There is another group of thrombophilias, what are called the hereditary thrombophilias, and the hereditary thrombophilias might be studied as well, but they don't, they don't seem to have an, as an important relationship with the, the recurrent implantation failure as the rest. So it has to be more selected what patients it is necessary that we test for those thrombophilias. And usually we would be testing women that have additional risk factors apart from the recurrent pregnancy loss or miscarriages. The contribution of immunology to implantation failure of euploid embryos is something that um, it is still very, very controversial. And although it is still uncertain that the immune system plays a role in implantation, our understanding of physiology, let alone the pathophysiology, remains incomplete. So it is very important that we try to gain more clear evidence of the causes and tests and implement uh, treatments that are, are successful for that. But in the meantime, it is very important that both immune testing or, or the empirical treatments that we might use uh, as immune modulators must be approached with a lot of caution for the moment, okay? There has been a, a recently published paper in which uh, they found out that spe specific combinations of acrotypes in the trophoblast and the ligand of the natural killer cells might have different patterns in which the likelihood of having a pregnancy loss might be higher. The natural killer cells are cells that are usually present in, in a natural way in the uterus, and they are going to interact with the trophoblast, which is part of the cells of the embryo. And depending on those combinations, we might have a higher risk of having a pregnancy loss. So if we have a combination of here A, C1, or we have a combination of here B, to the likelihood of having a pregnancy loss is higher. And in those cases, we might be looking at, in the case that we're doing a treatment with an donor to look uh, for an donor that is C1 to try to have a combination with less risk of pregnancy loss. And if we have the QRB haplotype, one of the things that might be considered would be treatment with steroids. Still, this is very recent and still in, in, in the phase of studies, but it's something that can be considered. And now I would also like to, to, to speak a little bit about the healthy lifestyle habits that we can have as patients when we're about to have uh, any fertility treatment, but also with, uh, with uh, egg donation treatments and especially after having several failures, because those also play a very important role in the likelihood of success. It is very important that couples with recurrent pregnancy loss are informed that smoking, alcohol consumption, obesity, and excessive exercise can have a negative impact on the chances of a birth. And therefore, the cessation of smoking, normal body weight, and limited alcohol consumption, and a normal exercise pattern are recommended. So smoking has a detrimental effect on, on fertility in general. But it also increases in general the risk of spontaneous miscarriage topic pregnancy. Um, it increases the risk of an mutagenesis both for male and female, and it also uh, makes a detrimental effect on the, on the um, parameters of the semen analysis. So those are for the lean smokers. And also there is growing uh, data um, that it's um, making very clear that even passive smoking has also negative effects in, in that sense. 
In terms of obesity, it is also important to consider that uh, patients who are obese have higher uh, relative risk of being childless and uh, the likelihood that they have a life birth is lower than in patients who have normal weight. Uh, there are some cases in which there has been reported a uh, risk, uh, higher risk of miscarriage. And on the other hand, being on the way, this is also a risk factor. So trying to have a healthy BMI is something important to take in consideration. Obesity has also a negative effect on the likelihood of having normal uh, sperm uh, parameters and also can lead to other kinds of problems related with uh, erectile dysfunction and uh, hormonal disorders in men as well. There was a study done um, on obese patients uh, and in patients who, who had normal weight, but they were all undergoing a cycle with eggs that were coming from an egg donor and the, that the donors were, um, were donors who had completely normal weight and they stratified the, the patients depending on their BMI, the, the recipients. And what they found out is that even though the egg donors had completely normal weight, the weight of the recipient was extremely important in terms of the success rates. They looked at the implantation rate, the clinical pregnancy rate, and the life birth rate and the miscarriages. And what they found out is that when the BMI was higher than 30, the implantation rate, clinical pregnancy rate, and life birth rate were lower than in the groups that had normal weight or that had a little bit of overweight. So there is a little bit more evidence that this is something that should be addressed whenever possible. Diet is also something that there is growing evidence that it also has a very important impact on the likelihood of having a successful outcome. Even though the, most of the patients will, will have normal weight or even if something high, uh, high weight or being a little bit overweight or obese, the likelihood of having micronutrient deficiency is quite high in general population. And uh, it is very important to make sure that we don't have any micronutrient deficiencies when we are about to do a, a cycle of, of fertility when, whenever we are seeking a pregnancy. Um, some of the studies that has, have been recently um, uh, published say that whenever patients follow a diet that it's closer to a Mediterranean diet, so very rich in fruits, vegetables, uh, pulses, and to and patients that diminish the, the intake of fatty foods, uh, fizzy drinks, fast foods, and not that much animal products, that might lead to have a better better outcomes whenever they are doing a fertility treatment. And going back to the case that I was explaining, so Jane and Mark have done several tests. Uh, Jane has done a hysteroscopy that was completely normal. Her endometrial filters were negative. She's done the thrombophilia test and she came, uh, we came up with a diagnosis of an antiphospholipid syndrome. And uh, her endometrial receptivity test came back pre-receptive. So, and the tests for, for Mark came back completely normal. He had completely normal semen analysis. DNA fragmentation was completely normal as well. And his cardiotype was normal. So we've done an ectonation treatment and we've treated Jane accordingly to the antiphospholipid syndrome um, following the, the guidelines from the HRA and the recurrent pregnancy loss guidelines. And we gave her low dose of aspirin starting before conception and a prophylactic dose of heparin when she already started, uh, when she was already pregnant. And uh, the other thing that we've done was a personalized entry transfer at progesterone plus seven as her endometrial receptivity test came back pre receptive. And finally, we got a positive pregnancy test. So this is um, a happy story with a happy ending. And this is basically everything that I wanted to explain to you today. I would like to thank all the audience for your time and attention. I would like to wish you all uh, a successful fertility journey in behalf of all, all our team. And now I would be pleased to answer any questions that the audience might have.
Thank you, Dr. Maria, for the presentation. And of course, now it's time for our questions and answer session. I do see that we already have some questions, so let's begin with the first one. You will be able to, of course, see it. Okay, we received 11 oocytes from two donors, nine got fertilized with my man's semen, which is of good quality. On day five, we had six embryos, but none of them had reached the blastocyst stage. On day six, there was only one blastocyst left and of poor quality. Maybe the cause of such a poor result. Additional information, the, the oocytes were sent by plane. The clinic doesn't have any embryoscope. Okay. Okay, so I understand from, from the information that you are providing that you had two different cycles of egg donation and with, with two donors and that unfortunately you just got one blastocyst um, on the stage of day six and it was very poor quality. So the, the causes of such poor result might, might be a lot of different causes. One of, one of the things that should be looked at is maybe looking for a different egg donor, obviously, that I'm thinking that that was already done. Uh, the other thing is that even though the semen quality is good quality, I am not certain if all the, all the tests that might be relevant were done, okay? Um, when, I, when I say all the tests um, relevant were done, I, I refer to, apart from the semen analysis, if there are any... Um, um, apart from the semen analysis, sorry, if the, if the DNA fragmentation was done in the case that was necessary for a fish test. Okay, thank you. And we have another one. To improve the chances of having good embryos, do you recommend to order oocytes from two donors instead of one? I don't necessarily think that this, this is what should be done from the very beginning. As I was saying before, in general, we would be uh, aiming to have 70% of the eggs that come from a donor should be euploid. As I was saying before, that can vary a lot depending on the, the clinic and all the, all the processes that are done in the lab of the clinic. So I think that I would probably recommend to go for one donor once, and then if the, if the treatment is not successful, obviously I would be looking to, to changing the donor. Okay. And we have uh, another question from the same um, attendee. Um, do re reliable clinics assess and publish the euploid rate of their oocytes donation program? This is this is something that that should be should be public, obviously. Yes, all, all the data from from the from the clinics should should be you, you should be able to ask for the data from the clinic, and they should be able to give that data to you. Okay. Thank you. We have another one from Doreen this time. Does your clinic offer donor egg or embryo guarantees? Um, yes, our clinic guarantees uh, one blastocyst. Okay. One good quality blastocyst per mm -hmm. cycle of, okay. of fake donor. Okay, thank you. And there's another one. I am very stressed out when it comes to treatment. It is very difficult for me sometimes to sleep. Do you recommend to take sleeping pills to improve egg quality? Hmm. Uh, look, there are some very little studies uh, that are still controversial made with melatonin, which is the hormone that is related with sleeping. And uh, the melatonin has a very important um, antioxidant, um, antioxidant effect. So I think that there is no harm on trying to take the melatonin. Uh, at least you're going to, to sleep better during the time that you're, you're taking it. And that might have a positive outcome or a positive impact on the quality of the eggs, even though, as I'm saying, those are very, very small studies and the evidence is not that clear. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds okay. Great, thank you. There's another one, and we when we speak about IVF egg donation program success rate, do we usually speak in terms of embryo transfer or IVF cycle, which can include more than one transfer? In general, when we speak about IVF egg donation program success rates, we will be speaking per cycle, not per transfer. Can you please confirm the best BMI to reach? Hmm. Ideally, ideally, the BMI to consider that it's completely normal should be between 20 and 25. Okay. The data are referring to fertility, it's, it's strong and it's very clear whenever we have a BMI that is higher than 30, which would be considered obesity, that the likelihood of having a successful outcome is less. Whenever we speak about being overweight, that would be a VMI between 25 and 30, the data is not that clear. And if um, if you look again at the, at the slide that I showed before with that um, study that was done with patients, depending on their BMI with uh, the donation, uh, the, um, the outcomes did not differ that much between the groups that had a VMI between 20 and 25 and the group that had a VMI between 25 and 30. But for overall health and to have the best fertility um, outcome, if possible, I would be able to have a VMI between 20 and 25. All right, yes, thank you. And let's see another one. What is the AMH result that qualifies a single female for egg freezing? Um, I think that in sense of the egg freezing for, for a female, the AMH is important, but also the, um, the age is probably the most important thing. Uh, the likelihood of having a successful cycle for egg freezing and that then those eggs are euploid and therefore they have good likelihood of, of then giving a baby to, to, the, to the patient depend more on the quality of the eggs that it's mainly related with the age rather than the quantity. So um, I would say that probably the age would be a factor that, that it's more important than the AMH in that sense. Um, but obviously a patient who has a very extremely low AMH, it has to be discussed with her that probably even though we do a stimulation cycle, we might be collecting very, very small number of eggs and therefore we might need to repeat that the cycle several times, aiming to have a good number of eggs frozen to have realistic options of having a baby. Okay, super. Thank you for explaining all that. And let's see, we have another one. Um, I had a twin miscarriage at 49, 49 last year. I was unsure why, but was told it could be due to fibroid. I have not removed fibroid. Can I use the remaining embryo for another IVF? Okay. Um, I think that the most important thing that has to be taken in account here and that maybe I didn't explain with full detail during the presentation is that the fact that there are fibroids present in the uterus doesn't necessarily mean that these, these fibroids are interfering with implantation and uh, with, with um, the, the likelihood of having a successful cycle. When the fibroids are located, what we call in the outer part of the uterus, which are the subserous um, fibroids, or they are inside of the uterine wall, they usually do not interfere in the likelihood of success. In that sense, as you are already 49, we have to think that in the case that you have a fibroid that is also interfering inside the cavity, that will probably imply a surgery and you might have to wait some time until you can have the remaining embryo done. I think that one of the things that maybe you should discuss with your doctor is if, if it's necessary to do a hysteroscopy to rule out the possibility that that fibroid is interfering inside the cavity. Um, before doing the, the embryo transfer with the embryo that you have remaining. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, what countries approve sex baby selection and genetic selection process done to a single woman? Um, unfortunately, I don't have the list of all the countries that, that accept that. What I can tell you is that those um, those processes are not are, are not um, available in Spain. 
As far as I know, the US uh, allows for sex uh, baby selection and the genetic selection process, but uh, um, I'm not certain about what other countries in Europe might be, might be accepting that. I can tell you that we can't. Sorry no, for course. that. That's understandable. In a few countries in, uh, in Europe, actually, the, it's possible to explore. So, of course, Spain is not one of those countries, right? All right, so let's go to another one. Uh, what is the AM age limit to decide that a patient should move to egg donation? Again, with the AMH, I think I, I've had patients who are 36 and that have a very extremely low AMH. And even though I explained to them that their chances of having a good response to the stimulation and having a good number of eggs were st extremely low, they wanted to do the cycle. We've tried, we might have collected one or two eggs. And they, as they were young patients, they had a successful outcome. I think that, uh, again, age is extremely important in terms of deciding. Uh, if it's a moment to move to egg donation or not. Obviously, a patient who is young and who has already tried uh, several IVF cycles with her own eggs that did not succeed, and apart from that, she has low AMH and uh, the number of eggs that were collected was low, I think that then it's time to speak about egg donation. I think the most important thing is to, to make sure that the patient is informed about all the options that she has, that she is completely aware about what what they can expect from each treatment and the success um, the success rates and, and, and the problems that might arise along a cycle. Okay, okay thank you. We have another one from, from Linda. What are the two most critical aspects a 48-year-old woman should investigate prior to selecting a clinic for egg donation with her young husband's semen? Okay, so the most critical aspects, I would say uh, that, this, uh, that you look for a clinic in, in which um, you, you, can, you can see the results that they have and it's a clinic that, that, that you can trust. And then uh, I would look also at, uh, at the, probably the, the facilities that they give you in terms of, of organizing the cycle in the, in the easiest way possible for you and your partner. Thank you. Let's see another one. At 51, do I stand a chance of success with uh, egg donation? My period is not regular, I believe. Okay. The, the fact that the period is not regular, it's not a major concern because whenever we are doing egg donation cycles, with, uh, we can even do that with patients who have early menopause or patients who have premature ovarian failure. So that would be not a major problem because we would be using a protocol with a hormone replacement therapy and that, that would be addressed. So um, this is something that can be taken in consideration. But on the other hand, in general, in most of the, of the clinics around Europe, the agreement is to treat up to, up to 50 years of age uh, some clinics might be a little bit more flexible until 51, but what I would suggest is that um, if you're thinking about doing an egg donation treatment, I think that it's it's a moment to try to 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 move on and, and uh, let let things started uh, because otherwise it might be too late. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another one from Melinda, which is better and has a higher level of IVF success to transfer the embryos by airplane or to freeze oocytes for a longer time at the same clinic. If the if the shipment of the embryos and the freezing of the oocytes are done properly, following all the, all the legislation and the processes are, are the ones that should be applied, um, I think that the, in terms of success rates, uh, that should be similar. Um, nowadays, we, uh, we've been vitrifying both eggs and embryos for a long period of time. So uh, nowadays, the success rates with both um, embryos and oocytes are high. So I think that that should not be uh, the fact if the embryos are shipped by plane or the eggs are frozen should not be one of the main um, reasons why you're deciding for one treatment or the other. All right, thank you. 
Um, my wife has nine plus IVF failures with donor eggs and with adoption embryos. We only had one positive HCG and HCG and rest had implantation failures. Last attempt we did was based on URA test with no success. What shall we do now to resolve implantation failures as my wife is only 43? Okay, in that sense, I assume, but uh, I assume that probably most of the tests that I explained before were gone, but if that's not the case, I would say that it would be good to do a hysteroscopy. It would be, it would be good to do a thrombophilia testing to, to make sure that there is no other issues, to look at having a normal BMI and uh, to, to follow a healthy lifestyle. And then the other thing that I think that it's important to take in consideration is that uh, from the male side, I'm not certain if there's anything that has been studied apart from the semen analysis, if there is any other genetic test that should be done as well, and maybe consider uh, in, that, in that case, I, I think that there might be place for considering or at least discussing uh, the cycle with PGS to try to diminish as much as possible the likelihood of, of having another baby. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see another one from Maya this time. Does endometrial scratching increase your chance of IVF donor success? Uh, endometrial scratching is a procedure that um, it's done usually, or the, the recommendations, at least for the data that we have so far, it's a procedure that we would be indicating in patients who have had several embryo transfers with good quality embryos that, that did not implant. And uh, this is the subpopulation of patients that might be benefiting for a lot. So I think that there is no harm on doing the, the endometrial scratching in that sense, in that case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm, we have another one. What is the age limit to have IVF at your clinic and where are you based? We are based in Barcelona and our limit of age for having IVF is 50. Sure. Chris. And let's go to the next one. What insurance companies offer in case of IVF failure after egg freezing? What insurance companies offer in case of IVF failure after freezing? I after guess. Freezing? Could you, Alinda, could you please um, explain what you mean? You mean when you're freezing, Alinda, you mean when you're freezing your own eggs or when you're using uh, an, an egg donor? I believe egg donor freezing, egg, I believe so, but I'm not sure. Alinda, please, uh, if you could just uh, write. If we're, if we're speaking, time. let's say, if you're using an egg donor and there is a complete failure of the egg surviving to the thawing process, that policy might vary between, between different companies, okay? Uh, um, the insurance companies might, might give you different policies, so I am not familiar with all of them. What I can tell you is that, for example, if in our training something like this happened, we would look for another donor and we would stimulate another donor uh, without having to charge you for, for that previous cycle. If we see that the failure is because of the freezing of the eggs, which has never happened. And if you're speaking about the failure after the egg freezing, with your own eggs. So if you froze your eggs and they failed to, to thaw, this is a completely different situation that might be linked to the quality of your eggs. And that, that might, there might be some companies that might not give you insurance. There might be others that might give you some kind of insurance. I'm sorry that I don't have a more clear answer for that, but uh, unfortunately, I think that the policies of insurance might differ between clinics and countries. Yes, exactly. Uh, Alinda was uh, thinking about actually using her own ex, so she just explained. So thank you for for uh, for the answer here. You're welcome. And let's take a look at the other one. Are the are the kinids that cell sites are that are not mature? Hmm. I am not certain about that. I would say that any any clinic that follows all, all the legislations and all and, and uh, that works under um, the appropriate circumstances should not be selling eggs that are not mature. That the eggs that are usually warranted in a cycle should be mature eggs. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, can you accept transfer of embryos to your clinic? 
Uh, generally, I would say yes, but before uh, being certain about that answer, what I have to say is that there are some some processes that have to be looked at. In general, what we do is if the if the clinic where you have the embryos frozen in follows the European legislation, there should be no problem. But it, usually, what the protocol that we follow is that our lab and the lab from the other clinic are going to get in contact. There's going to be uh, um, a communication between them and if all the processes are done, uh, are done uh, accordingly and it can be done, we would be doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And let's see, we have another one from Alinda. Have there been any legal cases where IVF fails because the eggs, for example, have been misused or, or misfrozen for any cause? Um, I'm not certain about that. I'm sure that probably um, somewhere in the world that that might have happened, but but I I don't have that information. I'm sorry. It is okay, of course. Okay, Alinda, we can um, we can, you know if you have any other questions like that, we can also you can also check with uh, um, our I patient. Think, uh, I think that uh, the same that I said before with another question, Alinda. What I would suggest is that you look for a clinic if you are thinking about doing a treatment. And you would like to, to freeze your, your eggs to do a, a make the purification or also a, a preservation of your fertility. I would suggest that you look for a clinic that has experience, that um, is uh, trustful, and that you rely on them, and that that, that you can have uh, some information about them, and that they have good results. That's the best warranty probably that you can have, and that you have the certainty that they follow all the all the EU regulations. Yeah, I believe so, exactly. So, very good to, to hear that. Thank you. And uh, let's take a look at, at another one. Um, what healthy diet or food program that increase fertility and can help with a successful cycle? Okay, in terms of food program or healthy diet, there's no, no, no specific diet, maybe, I would say. Uh, some of the studies, as I was saying before, were done with Mediterranean diet, and those uh, were saying that basically to have a diet that it's rich in fruits, vegetables, grains, pulses, uh, to decrease a little bit the intake of, of uh, animal products and diminish as much as possible fizzy drinks, um, fatty foods, any fast foods, and all those things. All these might lead to have um, a better, better for the, the outcome. And as I was saying before, one of the most important things is that to make sure that we are not deficient in any of the important micronutrients. So uh, this is something that should be looked at and, and consider taking some supplement, multivitamins or some supplements for preconception, just to make sure uh, that we don't have any deficiencies. The prevalence for vitamin D deficiency, for zinc deficiency are, are pretty high in population. So that has, has to be addressed. Okay, super. Great, thank you. And we have another one, AMH of 3.5 and age of 34 single female. What is your advice? Um, AMH of 3.5, I, um, I don't know if we're speaking about nanograms or picomoles. If we're speaking about nanograms, uh, if, the, if the units with which the AMH is measured are nanograms, that's still uh, a good um, uh, a good AMH, which would be considered normal. If we're speaking about picomoles, it would be uh, relatively low um, low AMH. Still, there is part of the information that I'm missing. The H is perfect, so we would like that all patients that are considering to do a fertility preservation treatment, they do that before they reach the age of 35. So being 34 is a very good moment to do because we know that the inflection point in which both quantity and quality of the eggs starts to decrease, it's usually at 35. Um, the other important uh, information that I don't have and probably um, you will have now, it's that apart from the AMH, the other tool that we use to calculate the ovarian reserve is what we call the antrofollicular count. The antrofollicular count is done when we do a vaginal scan. And what we do is count the number of follicles that we see in the ovaries, the number of antral follicles. That's the information that we are going to, to use with the AMH to calculate more or less what's the ovarian reserve and therefore the likelihood of those ovaries responding to the medication. And these are basically the tools 
We also the age and the BMI that we use to decide what kind of protocol would be the best one to use in that in that patient and what would be the dose of stimulation medication that that patient will need. But my advice in general for a 34 um, year old female, I, it would be more towards doing the preservation now rather than later. Uh, because obviously the quality of the eggs is not going to get better and the ovarian reserve if something is going to be worse. Super, perfect. Thank you. Um, we have another what What can I do to have a balance of progesterone and estrogen? Well, um, in that sense, maybe um, the most important thing would be that there is um, a blood test done at the, during the cycle in several times to see if the what we call the ratio between estrogen, estrogen and progesterone is the normal one. And in that case, if it's not, maybe you can, uh, you, during the cycle, you might discuss with your fertility um, consultant that you might need a supplement of estrogen or progesterone to make that balanced. All right, good, thank you. In last attempt, my wife was asked to use Screenor 8% with Prolatex 25 milligram, Clexan 0.4, and Estrofem with progesterone starting 144 hours before embryo transfer as indicated but ERA test. What shall we do now in our next attempt as progesterone may still have to start 144 hours before embryo transfer? What shall we do now in our next attempt as progesterone we still have to start one I don't really understand uh, what shall we do uh, in the, in that sense in that question. I'm sorry about that. If you can clarify a little bit more because it seems pretty clear that um, in that sense the medication was very clear and that the days of progesterone were done according to the result of the ERA test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that is it, if it's possible for you to perhaps, you know, send uh, some details to patient at eggdonationfriends.com and of course we are able to um, ask uh, Dr. Maria to, to get back to you with, uh, with some answers, okay? Perhaps if you could provide us with some more details. Yes, I will be pleased to do that if yeah, we exactly. know the, the okay. rest of information. That's no problem, absolutely. All right, perfect. Okay, I will just, um, I will keep that in mind, of course, as well. And let's take a look at uh, the other one. What kind of food or medication must be avoided to guarantee a higher success of IVF and egg freezing? As I was saying in general, it's something that probably it's common sense, but, but what I would say is that to try to avoid smoking for sure, to try to avoid as much as possible alcohol, to control the intake of caffeine. And uh, I don't, I would, necessarily say that there is any specific food that you should completely avoid but the the less you eat any kind of uh, foods that are not healthy in general so very fatty foods uh, foods that uh, in general animal products or, or or foods that have very high uh, percentage of uh, saturated fats that's what i would suggest that are the, the foods that i would um recommend to avoid and also on the other hand any any foods that have a very high percentage of refined sugars or sugars in general those are also foods that i would recommend to avoid as i was saying before try to follow a diet that it's as close as possible to mediterranean diet okay and don't eat with lots of fruits vegetables and um, drink lots of water and uh, that's pretty much it yes of course all right and uh, we have another one about, um, yeah, does acupuncture can improve uh, of donor IVF success? That's mm. interesting. Um, that, that's, a, that's a question that I get from a lot, a lot of patients about acupuncture. Look, um, as far as I know, there are some studies published saying that maybe acupuncture can have an, um, a positive outcome in, in fertility treatment in general, even with uh, with treatments with uh, donor IVF. What I would suggest is, uh, and what I generally recommend to patients is that if you have the time and you also can afford it, I have no no um, no problem at all with patients doing acupuncture because it's something that might possibly have a positive effect. But as I am saying, as far as I'm concerned, there is no uh, 
clear, definitive evidence about that, even though there are some small studies saying that it might possibly have a positive effect. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And we have another one. Uh, if we submit a letter from my wife, doctor, explaining what treatments have she undergone and still had nine plus failures, can you help and provide advice what you will do in your clinic as a step forward as we are looking to change clinic? Yeah, that would be no problem at all, that we can do that absolutely. What I would suggest is that we, using the same um, email direction that that you have provided before, that you, you can forward me all that, all that data with all that information, and we can discuss uh, your case uh, after doing a proper medical history and having all the details of the center as well. All right, super, thank you. We have another one from Sage. I am 51 years old. Uh, I removed fibroid last November 2017 and ready for another IVF treatment. What is the success rate for frozen embryo? I can confirm previous wear of good quality and was frozen. Should I decide to use the, the same again? So, again, I'm assuming that you still have embryos frozen after the last cycle. So I think that if the embryos were good quality, the fact that you had a transfer and that did not work, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the embryos that you still have frozen from the egg donor are fine because as I was saying before, it's not 100% of the embryos that come from an egg donor that are going to be euploid. Unfortunately, there's a small part of those that are not going to be completely normal. So it might have been bad luck. So I think that if you still have embryos frozen and they are good quality from that donor, you can use them without a problem. If you don't have any more embryos frozen from that donor, what I would suggest is that probably if the treatment did not work before, it would be a good idea to try to, to change the donor just in case. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, I have uh, another one. I am 39, AMH is 8, AFC 12, and I had two IVF with my own ex that failed. I had two blastocysts in the first IVF cycle and one good quality in the second one. Shall I try with my own ex or shall I consider egg donation? I would say for, for the information that I get here, um, I'm thinking that probably you did not do PGS in any of the cycles. So I think that uh, before moving on to egg donation, taking in consideration that you are still 39 and that your ovarian reserve is still okay. I think that one of the things that I would probably consider is to do another IVF cycle that I would do a pre-impotational genetic screening. The other thing that is important is that we don't have any information about, um, about your pattern here. So I think that it's important also to assess if the semen analysis is completely normal and maybe to do a karyotype and, and consider doing other, other genetic tests depending on the results of the semen analysis if that was um, something also to consider. Perfect. Okay, we have another one from Sage. Thanks. Uh, can your clinic be flexible to accommodate 51 or 52 years old for IVF? This is something that uh, should be very, very individualized on, on very specific cases. Maybe patients that are at 51, we might um, assess the case in the medical meeting. Uh, but that, that's something that I cannot give a definitive response without having assessed the case before. So this is how we would do that usually. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you recommend a number of dummy cycles before the actual cycle for embryo transfer, having had a couple of failed cycles? I would recommend to do a dummy cycle in patients that we have, um, patients, for example, that have uh, been, uh, have premature ovarian failure and have not had a formal replacement therapy for a good while, or patients who have had menopause for a long time. But the, in general, we use the dummy cycles to try to see how it's going to be the response of the endometrium. And uh, that way, see if the dose of medication that we're giving and the strategy that we're following is the right one. I don't really think that it's necessary to do several dummy cycles before the actual embryo transfer. If you have had a couple of cycles that failed, but the thickness of the endometrium and the quality of the endometrium were, were fine, 
I don't necessarily think that it's necessary to do other than the ciphers. It is, um, is something that probably won't be necessary. All right, thank you. And we have another one, meaning when pregosterone should start before ET. As I said before, it really depends on the day that, um, that uh, the stage of the embryo that we're transferring. If we are transferring an embryo that it's uh, frozen on day three, the progesterone should start four days before in the morning. If we are transferring an embryo on day four, the progesterone should start five days before in the morning as well. And if we're transferring a blastocyst, so an embryo on day five, the progesterone should start six days before in the morning. I understand MACA and evening primrose oil is good for hormonal balance. Is this correct? Those are um, natural natural medicines that, um, as uh, as I said, uh, we with um, other other questions that we asked before, we we don't have any definitive evidence that this is going to to have. Uh, a positive or negative effect on the hormonal balance. I think that the primrose oil, there is no, no, no problem at all that we take it. And uh, the maca, so far, there are controversial studies. So I would say that it's something to, to discuss with your fertility consultant that, that you're doing the, the treatment with, because uh, you, you might find different opinions, opinions about using those things or not, like that are between the clients. Okay, thank you. And okay, that's an interesting one. Is coffee harmful uh, hurtful for fertility? Uh, there is um, a lot of studies done about that. Not not many of them are very good ones that include a lot of patients. And um, some of the data says that in patients who take more than six hundred milligrams of caffeine a day, which would be more than three cups three cups of, of coffee depending on how strong the coffee that you're taking but more than two or three cups might have an imp a negative impact on fertility but the more that we have the, the the less impact it seems to have that in general what we would be recommending is to not take more than two coffees a day just uh, until we don't have more evidence about that but there's no need to completely um give up coffee if you really like coffee because of that Okay. At least we don't have the evidence so far. Right. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Uh, we have another one from Sage. Can you help in determining why I had had rich recurrence miscarriage? Um, okay. So of course, Sage, if you could just send them send us some more details, of course, as well, right? We would be able to perhaps take a look at it. Is that right, yeah, I Maria? Think, I think that yes. I think that probably um, it would be uh, perfect if you can send me all the information also by the email, and then we can assess all the all the situation properly with all the with all the information. It would be probably the best thing to do. Yes, of course, definitely. You can send this again to patient at equidonationfriends.com. We will forward this to Dr. Maria, and we will try to help you out, of course. All right, um, let's take a look at another one. My wife had IVF failures with egg donation and embryo adoption. We had only one plus HCG. In the last attempt, the progesterone started 145 hours before embryo transfer based on ERA test. The doctor says we need to start progesterone at the same time, like in previous attempt, that is 145 hours before embryo transfer. What will you do if you are our doctor? Will you keep progesterone window more or less than 144 hours? Also, do you recommend PGS or NGS this time? As all the we have chosen proven fertile females below age 25 years and will choose the same in the future. Okay, so in terms of when to start the progesterone, I, I would follow the same as your doctor is telling you because this is according to the result of the ERA test and that's exactly the reason why we do the ERA test to find which is uh, where is exactly your window of implantation and to transfer the embryos accordingly to that window of implantation. Um, after having had several uh, failures with donation, I think that to do 
PGS, it's something that might might uh, might take place here or might might be considered uh, at least to see what percentage of the embryos are euploid and um, see if there is if we see that the, the rate of anaplasia in the embryos is higher than expected, we might be looking at also the, the male side of things to see if there is uh, a male factor that might uh, be increasing the likelihood of having anaplasia embryos, or maybe. Um, Thinking about, as I was explaining before, the, the euclid rates between uh, between centers, depending on the processes that are run and the donors might differ a little bit. Uh, but at least if you do PGS after having had several failures, that at least will decrease the risk that you have uh, a transfer with an embryo that was unemployed and will, will diminish the risk of you having a, an unnecessary transfer. And just to clarify, NGS, it's the technique that it's used. It's one of the techniques that can be used for doing the PGS. So it's the next generation sequencing, and it's usually the, the technique that it's used in the labs nowadays, in most of the labs, uh, for doing the PGS procedure. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, that was a long one, right? <laughs> All right, oh. let's uh, let's take a look. We have another one for Erika. How long does implantation take place, and what should or should a woman do during this period of time? So, as I said before, uh, in general, the window of implantation lasts for around four days, more or less. Uh, when we are uh, transferring the embryo, uh, the last stage should should be in, within the next following hours, more or less. But I would would also say uh, to to all patients, whenever they have a transfer, it's to not do anything that they might regret. So um, there is no need for staying at home, resting in, in bed without doing absolutely anything at all. Uh, I usually recommend all patients that they can do absolutely normal life, to, but to avoid. Uh, sexual intercourse in that moment and also to avoid doing any important physical efforts. Okay, exactly. All right, perfect. And I believe there is uh, one more question from Sandra. Um, this is a very popular question, I would say. So, um, do you recommend fresh or frozen embryo transfer for patients? That's, that's a very good question that would um, give us for, um, it, it's a very extensive topic that would, uh, we, we would need another webinar for to answer this question. Sure. But trying, trying to sum up, um, look, there is growing evidence saying that um, uh, we have very, very good results when we're doing frozen embryo transfer, basically, because when we're doing a frozen embryo transfer in general, the hormone levels are more similar to what we call a natural cycle, and then, therefore, it looks like the receptivity of the endometrium might be a little bit better, okay? Um, especially, this this is something that we have not, not all the clinics and, and not um, have moved to do that, and we're not doing that uh, for all cycles, basically, because we don't have enough evidence yet to do that. What I would suggest, or what I would say, is that um, our current practice is that in patients that have a very good ovarian reserve and that they have a very good response to the IVF cycle and that they have high levels of estrogen after after the, the cycle, that they have risk of hyperstimulation ovarian syndrome. For sure, we would be doing frozen embryo transfer because patients are safety goals first, and also because in those cases, we know that a frozen embryo transfer would give them better chances of success. But if we're speaking about a patient who has done an IVF, who has a very um, limited number of eggs, and they just have one embryo, I don't think that probably in that in that situation to do a fresh or a frozen, it's going to make that difference. So probably in that case, we would be doing a fresh one. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for that. Okay, that um, that is where that's, that is a question that um, is also asked quite frequently. So thank you for that. Um, I believe there is another one. In just a second. Okay, uh, from Melinda. So. Um, so is fresh or frozen um, cycle have a higher success? rate i mean level for IVF in such cases it's very it's very very similar very very similar at the moment mm -hmm. okay good thank you 
does overstimulation affect implantation negatively? Yes, when we, if you have basically um, overstimulation, or uh, when we're speaking about over, uh, of overstimulation, I assume that we're speaking about what we call the, the hyperstimulation of Adrian syndrome. And this, uh, this uh, it's something that we have every day more evidence that might have a negative, a negative um, effect on, on implantation. But basically, the main concern is. Um, the fact that the hyperstimulation ovarian syndrome is basically um, triggered by the HCG hormone, and the HCG hormone is the pregnancy hormone. So if you get pregnant, uh, that syndrome is going to get worse, and to control it is going to be a little bit more difficult. So as I was saying before, nowadays I think that we, we have all the tools to try to diminish as much as possible the risk of hyperstimulation ovarian syndrome on our patients. And I think that nowadays we also have the technology in the labs to have very good results with frozen and embryos. So from my perspective, there is no need to put any patients at risk because of that. And my, my, my answer for that would always be to, uh, whenever we have the, any, any kind of doubt about the risk of hyperstimulation, I would always recommend to freeze all the embryos and do afterwards a frozen embryo transfer without any kind of doubt. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, let's take a look. Okay, I do see one more question. At what age or at what aspect can we uh, say that egg freezing or IVF is po impossible or of high negative risk? I would say that in general, um, the likelihood of having a successful outcome using um, doing a month and oocyte preservation cycle at 40 or over 40, the likelihood of having afterwards a successful outcome is it's relatively low. For sure, I would probably discourage a patient of doing that whenever a patient is 42 or 43, for sure. If the patient is 40 or 41, it would be probably um, discussed depending also on the AMH and the antrofollicular count and, and being very uh, being very clear and very conscious that probably a very high percentage of the eggs that we might be collected are going to be eggs that are going to be unemployed. So to make sure that patient doesn't have false expectations about about the the, 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 the real um, the real probabilities of success. Okay, thank you for that as well. Uh, I believe there is one more. Yes, okay. From Erica this time, what's, why some clinics only tell the age of donors after having a positive test? Isn't it unfair? Um, yeah. Every, every clinic has different protocols and different ways of working in general. What I would say is that in our clinic, we always inform the patient before, uh, before having the transfer about the basic characteristics of, of the donor. You know that uh, in Spain, a donation is anonymous. Uh, so we can provide a lot of details about the donor. The only things that we can provide are related with the blood group, the age, and obviously, the ethnicity and color of hair, color of eyes, and all those things. But in general, we, we always give that information before uh, before the transfer. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, let's wait for a second. I believe someone is uh, yes typing. Of course, we will be slowly finishing, but of course, let's wait and see if we have any other questions. Okay, yeah, here it is. So, um, okay, let me take a look. Yes, okay. Okay. Let's publish this one. Um, so uh, this is um, also, as you can see, doctor, uh, can I have your email address, please? 
uh, I will send a detailed letter explaining my wife's uh, failure treatments performed with egg donation and option embryo outcome of after ERA test. My doctor seem to me, uh, seems to me has given up now, so I need to take advice from you what you will do for successful implantation if we decide to choose your clinic. Um, and of course, um, the Skype call will be possible. I will be able to um, send all the details um, to the doctor as well, if that's okay, right, Dr. Maria? Yeah, that's completely perfect. And, uh, okay, yeah. of course. Uh, so, you know, you can send all the details to, as I said, to our email address, which is patient at eggdonationfriends.com. You can as well find it, um, I will write it in the chat section. Uh, and of course, I will be able to forward all your questions uh, to Dr. Maria, okay? Uh, I believe uh, there is another question, so let's uh, go with that, okay? What tests should you do before starting egg donation? What tests do clinics need before starting? Well, in general, the, the main basic test that we would be needing or we would be asking um, patients uh, before they do a donation, it's, um, we usually ask them for a uh, for clearance from their GPs to make sure that they don't have any formal medical contraindications for a pregnancy. We usually ask for general hormone blood tests and also general uh, tests asking for the full blood count uh, coagulation, make sure that renal function tests are normal, liver function tests are normal as well. We check for the thyroid that might also play an important role in the likelihood of having a successful outcome. We would ask also for the result of the pap smear test and uh, obviously we would ask for an ultrasound uh, to, to assess how are the uterus and how are the ovaries. Then, depending on each case, we might need to ask for more or less um, tests, and that can vary also depending on medical conditions that the patient might have and also on their age. But they, they, those are the basic tests. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And I believe we have one more question. So let's take a look at this one. What kind of donor programs do you offer at your clinic? So uh, basically, the donor programs that we're offering are what we call um, just for transfer and a program that it's uh, uh, egg donation in distance. So basically, uh, one of the programs is a program in which uh, the patients would be doing all the follow up in their own countries, and then they would be flying uh, to um, to our clinic in Barcelona just for the for the entry transfer. And then depending on the legislation of the country and depending on the agreements, we might be able to offer what we call the donation in distance, but it's a treatment in which uh, the patient will not have to, to fly uh, to Barcelona at all, because usually if uh, taking consideration if you're doing the treatment with your husband and you're providing the, the sperm from your husband as well. So you would be doing uh, all the basic tests in your clinic. Uh, you would be freezing the sperm in your local clinic as well. That sperm would be shipped to our clinic. We would, uh, in the meantime, look for a, for a donor that suits your, your phenotypical characteristics. And then um, the embryos will be created in our clinic. And then uh, once we we'll have the embryos ready, the embryos will be shipped back to our clinic. And then we will be uh, doing just the preparation for the frozen embryo transfer there. And we will be having the transfer there. And in the case that you have a surplus embryos, those embryos will be shipped as well. So you, you will be having all the batch of embryos that you got from the, from the cycle in your local clinic without the need of having to travel again for for other frozen transfers. Mm, okay, super. Um, let's take a look. Uh, we have another question from Victoria this time. Are there any supplements men can take to improve their sperm to help with egg donation fertilization? Yeah, there, there are a lot of different kinds of supplements in the market that are for preconception. So um, I, I would not be recommending any specific brand. Most of them have very similar um, similar content. So what, what I would suggest is that it is also very important a healthy lifestyle from for, from the male perspective. So to have normal BMI, to not smoke, to to drink very little alcohol and if possible, no, and uh, to keep on having a, um, 
an active life, do some exercise and a healthy diet. Those are things that are, are very important. But I'm trying to say here that even if you're taking supplements, if you are not working on the other things, probably the benefits of the supplements are not going to be that, that big. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, let me take a look if we have any other questions. Um, okay, I believe there is one another. Okay, just one second. Sorry, just give me a minute. That's fine. Okay. Here it is. Oh, it's um, it's actually about uh, frozen eggs or fresh. So we, I believe, we already uh, answered that. And of course, Matt, don't remember that is being recorded. So you will be able to to take a look at the transcription as the doctor. Yeah, but that, that's no problem. I can I can answer that again. No okay. worries. And we use both uh, fresh and frozen eggs. Uh, mainly, what we um, we try to prioritize is the matching with the recipient. Uh, so and we and we're having the, the same results with with both uh frozen and fresh we are having a success rate around 70 percent every time that we do an embryo transfer with, uh, with the eggs that come from an egg donor taking consideration that uh, from the male side everything is completely normal so that that's what we would be aiming for but we prioritize the matching but we use both fresh and frozen mm -hmm. okay perfect thank you uh, what about supplements for women beside prenatal? I think that prenatal has already main uh, the, the main supplements that um, that you will need. So probably there's no need for you to take anything else in in that sense if you are already having a, a healthy diet. Uh, you will find that there is a lot of economic interests in terms of um, a lot of supplements and, and the impact that they might have. And, and uh, as I was saying, the evidence for that, it's, it's still very unclear and there are a lot of very small studies and in some of the cases for some supplements there are not even studies. So what I would suggest is that focus on the generally healthy lifestyle and with the, super, with the prenatal or preconception supplement that should be enough. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Let's uh, just have a look. That you spend, just to avoid that you spend any extra money on something that probably won't have a, 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 any important effect. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for answering uh, that question as well and all the other ones. Um, I believe uh, we will be finishing. Um, of course, if you will have any other questions, uh, remember you can write to us uh, pay at patient act at eggdonationfriends.com. We will be able to forward your questions to Dr. Maria and also remember that um, we will be able to um, publish the transcription of this event so you will have a chance to, to see it. All the answers will be uh, there online. And of course, I just wanted to thank Dr. Maria for her presentation and of course answering all those questions. And Dr. Maria, do you um, have anything else to add? Well, I just wanted to say thank you to all the audience for being here until so late. And uh, as we said before, uh, if any of anyone from the audience uh, would like to that, that we assess your your case, I would I will be pleased to do that. So you can you can forward all the information to Egg Donation Friends, and we will be pleased uh, to to address any of your queries in a more specific way. Okay, Super. thank you all. Thank you. That's that's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, of course, and I just want uh, would like to add that if you have any um, problems and you would like to um, get some advice, you can also uh, reach us, me or Elizabeth, uh, via our email, but also chat. Uh, we will be able to help you out uh, as much as we can, of course. 
Um, and of course, in such case, I believe we are able to, to finish right now. And I invite all of you to, um, to meet us uh, next week. We will have another uh, live event. Um, and I guess um, we will see, uh, we'll see each other next week. Thank you so much for participating and have a lovely night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.